we invite you to face the music of Frederick Lowe, the composer who has the shortest list of credits of any Broadway writer. A mere four shows of the film. But when you hear what they were, you'll see why he was a major figure. Frederick Lowe, known to all as Fritz, was born in Berlin in 1901 of Viennese parents, including a father who was a famous tenor in the world of operetta. In 1923, the family came to New York at the invitation of the great impresario David Belasco. But just when he was set to earn the Yankee dollar, Lowe Sr. died, leaving wife and son penniless. Fritz appears to have kept body and soul apart by becoming the first Viennese cowboy in the history of the West a piano player in a beer garden, a rehearsal pianist, and as we enter the 1930s, a professional boxer. The next time we locate him, comparatively undamaged, he meets Alan J. Lerner in the Lambs Club in New York, which was a sort of gentleman's club, except that it was full of actors. And the two men become partners, leaving the theater with a magnificent legacy of words and music for simple folk like us to enjoy. The simple folk turn up in the show Camelot, and to describe the people of medieval England, seen through royal eyes, welcome please Patricia Routledge, Helen Shapiro, and Colm Wilkinson. What 
The astonishing thing about Alan Lerner and Fritz Lowe was their ability to write words and music in an idiom very far removed from their own background and experience. Helen Shapiro will now demonstrate what happened in 1956 when a Viennese ex-boxer and a New York department store owner's son collaborated to write a song for a show centered around a London Cockney flower seller. And if that ethnic mix isn't remarkable enough, they follow that by putting words and music into the mouth of a French medieval knight alias Cole Wilkinson, who will sing If Ever I Would Leave You from Camelot. <laughs> And 
could I leave you running merrily through the snow? Or on a wintry evening when you catch the fire glow? If ever I would leave you, it couldn't be in springtime. Those two songs come, of course, from two of the most ambitious musicals ever written, My Fair Lady and Camelot. And their success is at least partly explained by the passionate love of England and all things English of Alan Lerner. It's not surprising that Frederick Lowe should have taken so easily to the composition of the great sweeping romantic themes which we find in Camelot, because that kind of thing was not so very far removed from the traditional school of Viennese composition into which he was born. But when Fritz was confronted by the earthy English characters of Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, the challenge was much greater. For instance, as Pygmalion is all about the class system and how the rich and poor can collide and cross each other's frontiers, there had to be a working class melody somewhere there. Now, where in 1913 would you find a working class melody? You'd find it in the music halls. Enter six of the unlikeliest dustmen you ever saw. The Lord above gave man an arm of iron, so he could do his job and never curse. The Lord above gave man an arm of iron, so he could do his job and never curse.
How do you follow My Fair Lady? The answer Lerna and Lowe gave was with an Arthurian musical about the Knights of the Round Table. Of course, it wasn't the first attempt. In 1927, Rogers and Hart had made a hit out of Mark Twain's A Yankee in King Arthur's Court. But this time, the original source was a modern masterpiece called The Once and Future King by a reclusive English schoolmaster called T.H. White. Totally overwritten, the original version of Camelot ran over four hours and needed drastic pruning during its out-of-town tour. Depression swept through the company. And but for the enthusiasm and determination of the show's star, Richard Burton, the production might well have collapsed before hitting Broadway at all. Patricia Routledge now sings one of the most beautiful, lesser-known melodies from the show, Follow Me. <laughs> Camelot, there comes a moment when King Arthur is beginning to get just a shade worried about the way Guinevere and Lancelot are looking at each other. It puzzles him. So, alone on stage, he tries to work out the best way of retaining a woman's love. The idea for the song was Alan Lerner's. Three years before Camelot was written, he was enjoying a chat with the novelist Eric Remarque, who was married to the famous beauty Paulette Goddard. When Lerner asked Remarque how he coped with the volatile Paulette, Remark answered more or less in the words of the King's lonely song in Camelot. Here to recall his advice is the internationally renowned baritone, Benjamin Luxon.
years away, said the wise old man. Oh, ain't known by every woman since the whole rigmarole began. Do I flatter her? I beg him answer. Do I threaten or cajole or lead? Do I brood or play the gay romance? And he's smiling. No, indeed. How to handle a woman? Mark me well, I will tell you. What's wrong, Jenny? Where are you these days? What do you think? I don't understand you. But no matter. Merlin told me once, don't be too disturbed if you don't understand what a woman is thinking. They don't do it often. <laughs> but what do you do when they're doing it? Now to a song that very nearly didn't surface at all. This was the one in My Fair Lady that Fritz Lowe, although he composed it, actually disliked. At every opportunity, he tried to have it dropped and very nearly succeeded. Looking back on the song, it's hard to see what he had against it. But whatever it was, at the last minute, a new verse was written which explained why the song was where it was. And suddenly, it was stopping the show. Don Lusher, one of the world's leading trombonists, band leader in his own right and all round good egg now becomes Freddie Einsford Hill on his lonely vigil outside Professor Higgins house where he knows his lady love is in occupation.
In the life of every Broadway composer, there comes a turning point, a moment when he stops being an apprentice and becomes someone the money men are prepared to invest in. For Fritz Lowe, this moment came in 1947, when he and Lerner wrote their third show. The first had been a prize turkey, the second an honourable near miss, but the third made everyone's reputation to say nothing of much hard cash. The story was inspired by James Barry, and concerned a highland village which comes to life for only one day every hundred years. Fritz was heard to remark that he knew a lot of drama critics like that. But this was the whole village. In the story, two Americans stumble upon the place and fall in love with two of its young ladies. So there's a big problem. Stay and be happy, but disappear for a hundred years, or go and lose love and enjoy the 20th century. While the jury is still out, Ben will sing a song celebrating the flora and fauna of the highlands. But before that, here are the King Singers with possibly the best known song from the show, which was, of course, Brigadoon. <laughs> Yeah. 